You're listening to The Main Loop, a bi-monthly talk show all about what makes a game interesting, engaging, and most importantly, fun to play. This is episode six. Confetti cannons, lights, call it, Super Bowl. I did the intro. Number six, yeah. Nailed got, that intro. Maybe nailed be the, that intro. intro I, got, I got more intro rings than anybody. And my intros were all fully inflated the whole time. Stu, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. A lot of uh, exciting games news coming out this week. A lot of, a lot of games being played. Yeah, there's yes. games, games, games gonna game. There's games everywhere. Game, uh, my God, it's full of games. It's games all the way down. It's games on games on games. <laughs> uh, okay, speaking of, this is a show about games. I'm Sean Bragg. I'm joined, as always, by Stu Urbach. Who... Crap, is this a show about games? I did not sign up for that. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I tell you that this was about gains? Were you planning on talking about capital gains and your market well, I was talking successes? About, I was going to talk about getting swole. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Stu's swole cast. <laughs> You're listening to the grunt cast. <laughs> Stu's <laughs> show all about getting swole. Uh, getting swole with Stu on StuTube. <laughs> well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lead off today because I've got beef and I figure we'll get the beef out of the way. Uh, vegetarian listeners can skip ahead about three, three minutes. I'm going to say three minutes and 48 seconds. We'll see how we do. I'm going to start a timer on that. That's great. Uh, so a new game came out called Stagehand, uh, stagehandgame.com. If you want to find out more about it. And it's a great little retro graphic looking platformer uh, on mobile on right now. I think it's only on the iOS app store. And it's from uh, Big Bucket. And these guys made a game called The Incident, which was, that that was kind of my first uh, incident. I came out in like 20, uh, 2011, I think. And that was kind of, I remember playing that and like, oh, this is like, this is really good. Like this isn't, this is a whole new kind of good on the app store. Uh, it was just a simple little kind of platformer where, did you ever play The Incident? Mm-mm, but I think I, I recognize it. Yeah, you're a little you're a little dude in a suit, and aliens are just throwing crap at you. So the whole the whole thing is just you're running back and forth, and you're jumping on this debris that's falling from the sky, and you're just trying to keep getting. You have to get high enough, and you have to not get crushed by it. It was a great game. It had a really cool. You could play it on your iPad, but you could use an iPhone as a controller. Mm. Um, it was kind of one of the first games to try to do something like that. And uh, yeah, anyway, it was great. Uh, same thing. You could like airplay it to the apple tv and it was a big deal because it was one of the first games where you could like before there were apps on the apple tv you could actually play it on there so really it was great great game the best game Uh, and they also made a game called space age which is it's kind of like the love child of like commander keen and the monkey island games like it plays like a old school point and click adventure game but has really really funny dialogue and it's just it's again a very well made game so they make they make good games um, I'll say there, if you, if you go on their website and read some of their press releases, you could, you could pretty easily discern that they are from Portland, Oregon, at least some of them hailing from Portlandia. Anyway, so they, this game comes out stagehand, stagehandgame.com comes out and again, it's a fun game, but I, I, the beef comes in. Here's, here's where the beef is. Here's the, here's the beef in my beef sandwich, which is. All the press about this game is how original and inventive it is because the whole concept is it's a side-scrolling platformer, plays like an endless runner. You don't control the guy. The guy runs left to right, and you have to use your finger to swipe the scenery up and down. So basically, like, you know, there's going to be a pit, so you need to slide the platform he's currently on up so that he'll be able to jump across. Or if there's a wall, you need to slide the wall up and out of the way, so on and so forth. Uh, it's fun. It's very easy to pick up. It's pretty challenging, but I'm hearing about this game and I'm reading the press on their website about this game. And it's even on their site, it's we've reinvented everything. Forget everything you know about platforming in video games. Cause here's Stagehand. What if, what if it played like nothing you've ever played before? And I'm going, yeah, I guess it's like nothing I've ever played before unless I've played Surf Fingers, which is a game that came out like maybe two years ago that's the exact same mechanic where you're a little surfer dude and you have to swipe up or down to make sure that the scenery keeps lining up 
so that he has a continuous line to keep surfing on. He doesn't jump, but it's it's the same concept. You move the scenery instead of the guy to make sure that he can keep going from left to right. And I'm not saying stagehand is a bad game. It's pretty good. It's very good, actually. It's really well done. You can tell they worked hard on it. I'm just my beef is with the 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 hype machine and 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 the hype machine on their own website, which is making it sound like, boy, we've really broken some new ground here. And I'm like, well, yeah, unless you played the game that this is a pretty direct like. I don't know that that'd be like making an endless runner, and being like, boy. You have never played anything like this before. It's like, well, unless we played like Cannabalt and every game that came after Cannabalt where you just run constantly. Like, yeah, do you understand? Like, uh, do you, do like you understand my beef? A, a game with a, you know, with a little Italian man jumping through plumbing, charging nine ninety nine, calling it the biggest release ever. <laughs> um. <laughs> That's even different. That would be like you and I release, like, I don't know, Ultra Linguini family. And it's a game about, I don't know, electricians who... For, for a second there, I thought you were actually going to suggest we release a line of pasta. <laughs> I was a little concerned. No, but that's a good tie-in opportunity uh, from the makers of Noob Shoes, <laughs> Ultra Linguini family brand pasta. And each each pasta, it's kind of like the uh, Amiibo. Each pasta has an identity. Each, each pasta you put on the little Linguini reader and it unlocks a new character in game. Yeah, yeah, perfect. I heard it. Yeah, Tr- I mean, TM. I mean, I played Sir Fingers when it came out, or a little after it came out, and I was not impressed. Like, it, it's fine. It's a thing, you know? It's, it's a 10 like, second time waster type game, you know? Yeah, yeah. I was like, oh, this is kind of cool. At first, I was like, oh, it's yeah, a potty this is game. Breaking, breaking some new ground. And then I was like, oh, okay. Like, where, where are you going to go with this? What are we doing here? Right, it's an it's an endless runner. You just happen to move the scenery instead of making the guy jump. And it was I don't know. It was it was disappointing in the sense that like I feel like a lot of times what happens on the app store now is like about twenty five percent of the stuff that gets featured is like really quality. I enjoy it. I come back. Stuff like rains. Um, stuff like mini Metro that gets featured. Like those are like doing cool new things. And sometimes I honestly feel like, although Sean is giving me dirty looks right now, sometimes I'm I'm, I'm listening. I'm listening. (laughs) Sometimes I really do feel like a game with an interesting art style. That's like semi thought out, but mostly just a platformer gets featured pretty highly. If the art style is good enough just mm. because of that and like can get a pretty pretty big release and i think this is a pretty good example of that where it's like yeah this is a thing but i don't know it's not really doing much for me yeah i feel like we've we've hit peak art style in at least in like mobile gaming because all it takes is you either have really blocky graphics like um what well, crossy road it's either that yep. or you have yep. you know quote unquote 8 bit pixel graphics which again, they look great, but that you're you're right. That's kind of all it takes to generate a hype store and to be a featured app. Is oh, it looks like Super Nintendo graphics. Okay, but is it is it any good? Like that that yeah. it feels like that's taken a backseat to the actual game being good has taken a backseat to the game looking good or look or not even that looking a particular way. Like looking, what's the cool way for games to look right now? Yeah, I feel like that it's a really easy tunnel to go down on the App Store. That, yeah, it's just like, okay, that's fun. Because I, I remember I, I saw Stagehands. I was like, oh, this is really interesting. Like, this is a thing that I could get excited by. And then I, like, saw what it was. And I was like, okay, that's that's nice. Um, you did that. Cool. <laughs> well, thanks. I <laughs> guess I'll just take take my money elsewhere. Yeah, well, speaking of that 25% of really high quality on the App Store, you've been playing, and this isn't just an, a mobile game, but you have picked up Transistor from the makers of, wait, what's it called? What's that game? Bastion. From the makers Bastion. of Bastion. From the makers of Bastion. A new dawn in video gaming technology. You know, it was pretty cool. So I'm actually, I'm not playing it on mobile. I'm playing it on my computer, though I have played a little bit of Bastion mobile. Uh, yeah, I'm just like loving it. It's just like, 
I loved Bastion, and I was like a little nervous about this one because it's like a similar sort of platform, or it's a similar sort of rendering style in terms of um, what you're how the game's view looks and I was like okay maybe they're just gonna like redo the same thing but it's like a totally different set of game mechanics where like Bastion was all about just like hack and slash yeah Bastion was very much like the action RPG this is like like it's like almost turn based but then it's not so like you have to like plan out your turn and then you can like pause and take breaths but then like you also like have all of these abilities that you can combine together into sort of you can chain them and you can you sort of what's cool about it is you have your special powers basically you trigger it and you create like a time bubble where you can take actions in sequence by spending time but the opponents can't so you get to sort of sequence out all of these abilities and then you press play and you do it and what's really awesome is it's like it's like comboing for people like me who can't actually combo in video games. Because <laughs> you should be like, pause. Okay, now let me think through everything. Let me, let me get these inputs in now. Yeah, it's exactly <laughs> like that. Like if I could do that in like uh, Su- Super Smash Bros. Or like, uh, not Super Smash Bros. I'm just going to. Street Fighter? Yeah, like in Street Mortal Fighter. Mortal Kombat. I would be so Soul good Calibur. at that game. Yeah, any anything like that. If I could just be like, whoa, 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 let's let's pause, let's take a step back. So anyway, Transistor makes me feel really great as a game player, and the the story is like really dynamic. They integrated a lot of their same like audio stuff that they did with Bastion, where the narrator talks to you, but it's in a very different sort of tone, and the relationship is different, so it feels really unique. Um, and I think the comment I made to you was like. It feels like the game I would make if I were an award-winning game designer <laughs> in, in Magical Christmas Land. I'm just like, oh my god, this is amazing. This is everything I've ever wanted in a game. Yeah, it just kind of pushes all of your buttons. Oh yeah, all of them. Yeah, I felt that way playing, and I haven't played very much of Transistor, only the first level or so, because I was playing it on mobile, and it's just, it, I, it, it can be the best game in the world. If it's on mobile, it just gets filed in my brain under like throw away disposable and so i don't actually dedicate time to playing through it but yeah from the very first like opening narration i was like oh this is this is a hell of a thing right here like this is really good and yeah the combat system in that game is really really i I really can't think of a good analog for it like it's really unique yeah like it's just doing a thing that i hadn't really considered in a game I was like, oh, you, you're just like letting me pause the game and then do a bunch of stuff and then unpause. This is weird. <laughs> I don't know how this feels, but it feels good. <laughs> well, so you do know how it feels <laughs> in that I don't it feels know what good. This fe- uh, yeah, you get what I'm saying. What is love? What is fun? Baby, don't hurt me. Oh, it, 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 well, it does hurt. That's a, that's a callback joke. See, if you've been watching the whole season then you would get that as a callback to an earlier episode. So it's an industry term. It's, it's fine. As someone who hasn't been watching this season, I don't get that. Joke. <laughs> yeah. Stu told me today before we started that he actually hasn't listened to this show yet. He doesn't, you don't, you don't, uh, what are they, what are the, what are they just do? You know, you're in, you're in the drugs. What do the drug dealers say? You don't, you don't do your own product. You don't. Yeah. You don't, you don't hit, take your own hit. We've got a treat for you today. We've got the whitest, most straight laced people on earth and we put them in a room and they're going to talk about drug use. Oh, this should be great, man. Uh, Fun fact. I actually considered making a worker placement board game about drug dealers. That just makes me think of the game drug wars and how, it much like real drug use, I frequently relapse and re-download drug wars onto whatever device is handy. <laughs> and then that consumes my life for weeks on end. It's just, I'm always playing drug wars. Got to buy low, sell high, baby. Buy low, sell high. Got to get that, that Percocet out there all day. All day. Well, here's the thing that I'm too scared to do. And that is to play this game called Perception when it comes out. Uh, did you get a chance to look at this trailer? I have not looked at the trailer. I was trolling around the website, though, and it 
seems intense. Yeah. So this is a new game coming out uh, from the same people who made uh, the original Bioshock, uh, Bioshock Infinite, and uh, Dead Space. I think that's just the first Dead Space. I don't think they were involved with the sequels. Just a couple of, you know, unknown games made by some some random Little indie tiles. You probably never heard of them. It's fine. It's fine. They're from Portland. So the whole idea is that you are a blind person. You're a blind woman, um, and you're exploring this house. I can't quite tell if it's you're exploring it actually in your dreams, but it's 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 a house that appears in the protagonist's nightmares, and you're there exploring it and trying to find the the mysteries. But the whole the the thing, the hook of this game, is that everything you see comes through echolocation. So as you're walking, you're either tapping your cane or there's things in the environment making noise, and that actually like lights up the area otherwise it's it's pitch black and just the trailer scared the hell out of me there's like a a grandfather clock starts going off and that's making the room light up and there's some kind of spooky monster type stuff and some moths and it just looks it looks very intense and i'm not i'm not one to play a game just because it's going to be scary but this really intrigues me because of a couple of things i said on the website the echolocation thing i just want to try for the novelty of it but um, this, this one bullet point on the site about the game says trigger radical change at the estate at Echo Bluff each time you solve its mystery uh, or its mysteries. So that's the part that intrigues me. The idea that it, it's almost roguelike ish. Like you're going to keep playing through, you're going to keep going through the house and every time something's going to be different about it. And you're going to kind of solve another piece of the puzzle and learn a bit. I, I like stuff like that where it's, you're kind of doing the same thing, but every time you're getting a little bit more information or you're solving a little more of the mystery. I don't know. That that part has me intrigued. Yeah, I mean, just from the small bits of the world I've seen, the idea of getting different levels of information based on what's going on, like what you do, seems really unique to me. Yeah. Um, and just like, I can't, I'm, I'm at a loss for words right now. <laughs> I mean, I, I like the idea, like what you're saying, like you're, you're finding new pieces of information and as you play through, Oh, because I did this now, this time I go to the house, this thing has changed or, and you're trying to find that. And I imagine it could be fun to maybe play through the game multiple times because of that, of like, well, the first, the last time I played through, I never even looked at the fireplace and who knows what that's going to trigger. <laughs> Yeah, it's also like in most games, you always have perfect information in a lot of ways. Like you might not know what's coming, but you know exactly what's happening in the space around you, right? Yeah. Like a game like Portal, like even if something's behind you, you can just turn around and you get perfect information, right? Like you always have access to everything about that space. But in this game, you actually, it looks like from what I've seen, it looks like you don't, right? Like you could see the world in a different way one moment to the next because of what you're doing or what's happening. Right. And that like has the potential to really change how you interact with the game. Well, in a game like Portal too, like the rules are explained to you clearly and you might learn a new rule, but the rules are set. They're the rules. And this is how the game works and plays. And you just get better at, at, you get better at playing by the rules. And I like the idea of this, where the game might not give you the rules like the, and it might, and it might, what you think is a rule might get broken the next time you go into that house. And yeah, I like, I I like, I like what it looks like. It kind of reminds me of a little bit of like Alan Wake and the things I liked about Alan Wake. Mm. But, uh, yeah. Um, but this, this did make, this did beg the question of like, is being afraid or scared or startled in games fun? And why is the answer yes? I don't know if the answer is yes for me, but I think, I mean, it has to be right. Like it's just about you're, you're interacting with your world in a totally different way. You know, most games exploration is about what can you discover Mm. and horror games are like the opposite, right? Or like, how can you limit your experience to only the things you want? <laughs> what are you hoping right. not to discover? Yeah. Right. How can, how can you avoid dis- discovering the thing that you don't want? 
Yeah, I think because, again, a game like Alan Wake that I really enjoyed, which was very suspenseful and spooky and had jump scares, but the game wasn't the game wasn't out to just jump scare you like that wasn't the point of the game. It wasn't trying to be terrifying. It was just it was a scary story set in lots of dark woods and, you know, being there's chase scenes and things like that um versus I, there was a game that came out it was like the evil within which is like you're being you know you're constantly being chased by guys with chainsaws and blah 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 and i, I realize some people it's like that but it's my life it's my life every day get up chainsaw fight them off chainsaw, chainsaws everywhere yep make my breakfast guy with a chainsaw pantry gotta fight them off train station more like chain station <laughs> Uh, we're cool yeah. yeah but i don't know i yeah or, or outlast was the big game where like it's pretty dark but you can use your little video camera to look through and see some light and people like that like the really survival horror type stuff i i don't know i i like yeah i think i think i don't know what what i might be picking up on from you is like i feel like the people who i always hear loving horror games with people who always talk about like narrative in video games hmm because like horror games offer this very clear like narrative experience where the narrative kind of touches the game mechanics. I think the question for me though is like, is narrative enough? Is is the horror is like the the scariness is like the hidden discovery stuff enough to make a game last outside of that very specific genre? Yeah. Right. Like imagining something like the Blinding of Isaac or. Sorry, the binding of Isaac. The blinding of Isaac. It's, it's set when pre, pre Isaac Isaac's much older, and he's got the glaucoma real bad. Yep. Yeah, but like you know, could something like that happen in a horror style, where it's not about fighting off waves of monsters? It's about you know, like trying to escape, and like, could that really itch the puzzle part of your brain the same way? Yeah. Well, I think I don't too, know. I don't know. I don't have an answer. Well, you mentioned that like horror horror game fans like like narratives, but I think of to me horror can often be like the Michael Bay school of narr- of like effective storytelling and narration, which is if things are blowing up and it's loud, then you must be telling a good story. And well, I was actually I was actually going with the opposite. I meant like narrative people like horror games, right? But what I was I'm I'm kind of disagreeing with you in that I think horror a lot of time, like I think people who say they like narrative experiences might like horror games, but I think it's actually a really often a really cheap narrative experience because the narrative is I don't want to watch my guy get thrown into a meat grinder or something else horrible happen, or I don't want the stuff to come like bursting out of the wall suddenly. And that's my whole motivation is just to avoid that scare. You know, outlast is I just don't want to see my guy's face get, you know, ripped off or whatever it is. Right. I I don't think we actually disagree. Yeah. Versus something where we're telling, like, again, I think Alan Wake is a great example of it was, I I thought it was a really good story. The gameplay was actually really fun. Um, The whole mechanic of you've got to shine your flashlight on the guys until they're not dark anymore. And then you can actually fight them for real. I really liked what it did. It just also happened to be very spooky and like it also happened to have kind of a more horror motif to it. So I don't know. I, I have mixed, I guess, I guess all that to say I have mixed feelings about horror as a genre. Um, but I'm excited about this perception game and I'm, I'm going to at least, I'm going to at least say that I played it and that it didn't scare me at all. And then everybody will think I'm, I'm cool. Yeah. You're legit. No, I, th- I think we agree. I think I think the question is really like, can a horror game be puzzly? You know, yeah. can it like really grab you from like a okay, I'm playing this to sort of learn about the game as much as I am to like have a narrative experience? You know, right? Which is which is I feel like the cheap thing that a lot of horror games sort of lean on. Which is great if that's the thing you like, but I yeah. don't know if that means that sort of genre has legs to go further. Yeah, because I think of a game like Resident Evil 4, which really, to me, it's one of my favorite games of all time, but it did a really good job of it. It had, obviously, heavy horror themes, but the gameplay was fun. Like, the action was well done, but there was there were tons of new ways to, like, you could, there were multiple ways to get through each, each level and mission. There were lots of secrets to find. Uh, the world was interesting enough that there was a level of exploration that 
Yeah, even if you know all the like scary parts that are coming, it was still a worthwhile and fun to play through multiple times and still managed to be scary playing through multiple times just because they did a good job of creating monsters that were compelling or frightening or situations that you could continue to kind of imagine yourself in. Whereas I think a lot of horror games are just like, well, I played that and the next time I play it won't, you know, Five Nights at Great. Freddy's, you kind of, you memorize the patterns and then it's just like, well, I know everything that happens in this and it's not, there's no real point to me playing this anymore. Yeah. I almost wonder if there's opportunity with like a marriage between like a, a stealth game and a horror game. Cause they both kind of evoke the same sorts of feelings. I think about like trying to stay hidden, you know, feeling powerless unless you're hidden. But to me, a hidden, sorry, a stealth game is like, has, has more legs to like, yeah, go more places. And so I kind of wonder if you could, marry those two to like really explore you know the genre in different ways well i think that's a lot of what uh amnesia the dark descent was yeah. about was yeah. you you got to find ways to hide because you can't you can't directly fight the monsters um and then you couldn't i believe you couldn't stay hidden for too long either because the whole the whole point is you're trying to not go insane and seeing the monsters makes you go crazy and staying in the darkness too long makes you go crazy so you had to ride this balance I've, I've tried to play that game multiple times and I get about five minutes in and I'm like, Nope, I'm not, I'm not strong. I am not strong. I am not a tough guy. I'm okay with that. Give me the chainsaws. Give me the chainsaws every day. Chainsaws. Well, that actually leads me. I'm going to skip a point and talk about something I realized recently when I sat down at my PC and tried to decide what game to play. And I realize I don't usually start with the game in mind. I start with more like what's kind of the experience or the feel that I'm looking to have in this, you know, hour that I have to play a game. Um, am, am I looking for a run around, shoot, blow everything up kind of experience, like fast paced action? Am I looking for a more exploratory, discovery driven? Do I want to just level up? Like, am I going to play something like Diablo where you just you can start a new character and you can gain 20 levels in an hour and feel a sense of progression or Am I in the mood for just wandering around aimlessly, like in something like Minecraft? It's really, it's picking an experience off of a shelf. And I don't know if you've experienced something like that, but... Uh, that, that's the that's the sequel to uh, Central Design by Stuart. It's Experienced by Sean. Mm, Sean although the, Experienced. Although Experienced by Sean sounds more like a cologne. Ooh. But anyway... <laughs> From the makers of Noob Shoes, Experience by Sean. I like it. I like it. And I could there see. go these last three listeners we had. Um. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, all three of you. Bye, Mom. Um, <laughs> no. Um, yeah, I think, I think I have a similar approach um, in that I typically only – Maybe not like when I play a game, because typically I'll like try to focus on a single game at a time. But I am definitely, I only pick a game that has like a very strong sort of experiential bent to it. Like I, I want kind of an opinionated game like that. Um, like, okay, this is, I'm doing this to do this thing. Like when I play, um, you know, like Guild of Dungeoneering, I'm like really excited about like, just like throwing a little guy at monsters and like building a deck of cards and like puzzling through that. You know, if I'm playing like Transistor, I'm really excited about sort of getting the, the aura of the world and like doing all these crazy combos um, while I fight. And so I'm really interested in games that like have a, a very specific focus for me like that. Yeah, just dis your distill it down to kind of its essence is what you you like. Like what is this game selling me and like kind of concentrate that. Yep. Yeah, I could see that. I I yeah, I think for like Rogue Legacy popped into my head, which is a very good example of like you want to run around and jump and hit things with swords, then you're playing Rogue Legacy, buddy. Like that is all there is to it. You're going to run around and hit stuff with swords or maybe cast a magic spell every now and again if you've been good. Um, and yeah, I like that. Cause that's, that's usually, I, it's like, I have this, my brain is telling me like, Hey, there's a very specific set of synapses that I would like you to go, uh, stimulate. 
<laughs> and that might be that might be the puzzle ones that might be the wander around aimlessly with ambient music and that might be the like the overwatch which is like can we run really fast and have bright colors and be blowing everything up as junk rat and just like can that be the thing we do right now yeah i definitely totally agree i think it's i think games are most successful when they sort of focus on a, a specific sort of feeling that i'm trying to get at as a player all right, Stu, you you have an all caps point here, an all an all caps bulletin. I just like I'm so excited for the Nintendo Switch. It's like two weeks away, two two and a half weeks did away. You, did you pre order one? I have I have not, um, because because apparently they cost more than well, more than some money. Um, <laughs> more than your <laughs> your monthly fund budget of no dollars. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, it's, there's like a good $10 in there. Hey, I have tens of dollars worth of disposable income. I will have you know. I have ones of dollars. I have, I'm a well-respected member of the community <laughs> and a highly sought after dinner guest. No, I'm just, I'm just waiting for Nintendo to, to ship us our, uh, our pre-release editions. <laughs> yeah. <obviously. laughs> yeah. The press kit. I'm really waiting for that. Um, but yeah, I mean, just with like, the the release lineup or at least the games that have so far been announced look pretty cool they do a lot of different interesting things that i think is pretty unique for nintendo especially um in terms of like just not being like oh it's all the nintendo lineup at release which is like the, what happened with the Wii U where it's like okay if you want this one thing great here's Nintendo which I love I love Nintendo well and it is funny that like the they have like two games at launch but of course one of them is the Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild which is everybody's like I don't care the, oh the Switch costs fifteen thousand dollars great I will I will yeah. take out a second mortgage to play <laughs> Breath of the Wild actually the Switch is free the Breath of the Wild is thirty thousand dollars. It's thirty thousand dollars. Yeah, deal. It's a steal. It's great. It's great. <laughs> There's a dog in it, so it's perfect. I mm. think that's it's dog um, money. But yeah, I mean, like all of the really absurd games of One Two Switch, which has like twenty eight games where you can, you know, like milk a cow, count bo- count like marbles inside of a box. Yeah, I loved I loved Glixel's review of that, which was like, we hate all of these. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and here's the ones we hated the least, but we hate yeah. all of these mini games. Um, and like arms, which seems like a mini game that got turned into an, an entire game, but I'm also still kind of excited about. That's um, the kind of Wii boxing ish one, right? Yeah. It's basically like Wii boxing that they tried to turn into a competitive game. And if it turns into an esport. I'm going to cackle madly for the rest of my life. I would definitely watch that though. Bunch of nerds in chairs making boxing <laughs> motions. Right. I'm very in, into that. Um, but then there's also things like steep, which is um, by Ubisoft. It's their like open world uh, downhill snowboarding, free gliding thing, which is basically just like a gigantic mountain where you can snowboard on. And it just looks really awesome. And it's the type of thing that, the Wii U didn't have. <laughs> mm. They didn't have like the GameCube with SSX tricky, which was just like. Also, so there are great. hints that there might be a virtual machine for GameCube games in the Nintendo Switch. Shut up. I know, right? <laughs> oh, like virtual console for GameCube. Yeah. Oh, damn. Yeah. Oh, man. Um, as my eyes dart around the room for things yeah. I can sell. <laughs> Like, I don't need uh, both of these babies. And then like Super Mario Odyssey seems like a really different take on Super Mario. <laughs> it's really weird. GTA six. Super yeah, like, Mario Odyssey. Like, is Mario gonna kill somebody? Like he's just gonna Can he steal cars? Bowser. That's all I care about. Can he steal cars? I know, I'm just waiting to see him like shank Brat Bowser in a dark alleyway and just like watch him die. <laughs> like, taking wow, the series okay. in a taking the series in a bold new direction, you know, with all these dark really real. <laughs> all these dark Marvel, you know, shows on Netflix, they decided it was time. Super Mario Dark. Um, but yeah, there's just like a good combo. And then obviously there's like Mario Kart and stuff. So I'm just I'm just pretty pumped. I think it's I think everyone who is pretty down on it is gonna be either pleasantly surprised or pretty shocked at, at how well it does. And I think it's going to, 
I think it's going to change the way we think about Nintendo again in terms of, you know, what they do. It feels like they actually listened to the majority of complaints that, that people have had about Nintendo over the last decade as far as they're not as developer friendly as the other platforms. You know, they don't have the they don't have as good a hardware. They're not really innovating anymore, like all that stuff. It just seems like they're like, well, it's got Unreal and Unity and we've got all these indie developers on board. I mean, the guys from Super Meat Boy said that Nintendo's like the best, like the best experience that they've had so far working with like, like any plot developing for a platform. And that's insane. Yeah. And it's just like, and not to mention the hardware of like, oh, we actually just took the Wii U and made it a controller and strapped it on the side of the Nintendo Switch. <laughs> like at first I, when I when I heard it, I was like, oh, this is really dumb. It's just like a dumb little controller I can like attach that right. costs eighty dollars. But it's like, no, it's actually like motion sensitive and haptic and like crazy everything. It's like, oh, oh, so you're just doing all of the things. That's that's decent. So I'm, I'm pretty pumped. I'm, uh, I'm looking forward to it. Okay. We have a very strange note in here, which is about league of legends. So yeah. I find oh, it, odd. I, but was this the right show? Did you, did you get lost in Google drive while you were typing notes in here? I did not. This is weird for me. I hate playing the game, but watching it as an esport is sometimes exciting and over the weekend there was there's some pretty awesome games between uh, cloud nine and FlyQuest. and FlyQuest is basically made up of all of the old cloud nine veterans that got booted off the team by ownership <laughs> and so there was like a lot of really great awkward nerd sports drama Love it. You know, it's like it's like Tom Brady, but with computers, basically. <laughs> I'm. I, so that's going to be the new again. That's the new tagline for when they're recruiting for esports next year. It's like Tom Brady, but with computers. Sign. Yeah, deflated, me, deflated, can I sign up twice? Deflated computers. I don't know. It was just. It was really exciting for me. I felt like it was the first moment where the narrative around an esports event was like as engaging as like normal sports are for me personally. I know there have been plenty, plenty of awesome moments, but it was just really interesting to see that kind of level of intrigue happen um, around the game. And I think that's kind of an exciting development for esports as we see them maturing um, into like fully fleshed leagues with their own sort of like player drama and all, all of that stuff. It's nice to see instead of just like, what feels sometimes like the players just getting exchanged every year for someone new where it's like, Oh great. Here's like another new person that I don't care about. Now it's like, Oh, these are like household names that I can get interested in and kind of follow. And so I'm interested to see how that plays out over you know the next decade. I just didn't take you for a, a league of legends guy. Yeah. It's weird. Weird, weird times, man. I have never, I have never played League of Legends or Dota. I, I watched. I mean, if you ever want to get yelled at for like forty to fifty minutes, there's yeah. really no better way to spend your time. After waiting six hours to get into a game. Yep, yep. I, I watched a tutorial video because that's that's the kind of thing that I do in my life on how to play League of Legends. And as soon as I got to the item store and that, I was like, this is not the game for me. This is not. I like picking up a sword. And then seeing are are this are the numbers on this sword green compared to mine or are they red? Because if it's red, right. I know that mine's better, and I'll keep mine. I, I didn't I didn't like that part. Actually, uh, when I so when I when I used to play League of Legends um, over in college, yeah, when I used to play, like I would like just basically like pull up item builds on my phone. Cause I was like, I ain't no, no one got time for this shit. I don't, I don't want to think, I just want to like click some <laughs> buttons, whatever. And then right. Like, tell me what to do. Yeah. Yeah. The, the guys who I would like play with, who were like very nice people in real life sitting next to me would see me with the item build and be like, dude, what are you doing with that? And I was like, I don't know. Trying to, trying to play a game. Just like, trying to get ahead. <laughs> just like, sorry, this is how I have fun. Unacceptable. 
Yeah, it doesn't sound. I have a friend who plays Dota quite a bit, and it sounds like it's an hour of waiting for two hours of not having fun, and it just don't doesn't appeal to me. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why like Blizzard. I'm still like step skeptical about whether or not Heroes of the Storm has like legs as a competitive league, but I'm really excited by stuff like Overwatch, where Blizzard is making a huge effort to be like, this is going to be a fun game for people who don't professionally play games right but also competitive <laughs> right but also yeah you can be you can make a go of it i feel like heroes of the storm has a good balance there too of there's there's enough to do as a filthy casual but the competitive the competitive elements seem to be improving um especially with there now they brought you know they brought their league in-house and play they got players on salary and like regular term i mean i i looked at the schedule there's like there's literally always heroes heroes of the storm esports on right now which is actually kind of fun right, like right now actually yeah so. any any time any time at work i am on a break i can flip over to their esports site and oh there's heroes of the storm going on so that element of it is fun and leagues the same way i mean there's always people playing league i think i think it's really exciting to see sort of mobas become the first big sort of crossover esport um and I'm, I'm intrigued to see where it goes. Yeah. Well, that looks like about the bottom of our list of things to talk about. Yeah. Unless you want to talk about chainsaws a while longer. Chainsaws every day. Um, I don't think so. Stu, where can people find you and your gaming adventures on the internet? <laughs> Well, uh, when they're updated, you can find me at uh, amateurmythology.wordpress.com. Coming at you from 2010. All right. Hey, at least you finally closed your blog ring. That was a big step. I know that was hard. It's it's crazy. I know shuttering your uh, Angel Fire page was also difficult, but I think it was time. Uh, I finally transitioned off of GeoCities. <laughs> <laughs> I'm at blue district dot cloud three <laughs> dot West Haven dot Northbrook dot geocities dot com forward slash. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You forgot the dot Neopets. <laughs> <laughs> there was always a Neopets in there. Oh man. So you're, you're what you're reviewing Tamagotchis or things like that over on that site. What are you, what yeah, are you doing Neopets there? actually just oh, 100% for seven Neopets. It's actually always a Neopets stream. No, um, I think my next review is probably going to be uh, Transistor. I'm kind of picking back up after Yoshi's Woolly World kind of left me. <laughs> kind of drained your will to keep gaming. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, this is not what games are supposed to be like. <laughs> <laughs> You're not even in a real game. Though it is adorable. Are you on Twitter yet? Not, not okay. yet. Okay. Okay. That's that's all right. That's all right. It's probably never going to happen. Okay. All right. Well, amateurmythology.wordpress.com. You can always find me tweeting at Sean and Bragg on Twitter. And be sure to stop by the iTunes store and leave a review for the show if you enjoy it. That helps more people find it. Uh, you'll notice some updated artwork and coming soon, some updated intro music uh, that yours truly is working on. I shouldn't have said that. I should have said that we sourced maybe, it. From, maybe even with the complete intro, I should have said that it was a uh, donate or something. So that if people think the intro music sucks, I can be like, yeah, whoever made that pile Got of crap, of <laughs> boy, he's fired. Let me tell you. Uh, no, it's me. I'm working on some new intro music and yeah. So leave us those reviews, uh, subscribe, tell your friends and, uh, we will be back in two weeks because this is not a bi-weekly. This is a bi-monthly podcast. I'll get I mean, that right. I'm here bi-weekly, just kind of lonely. <laughs> we don't actually record, but... <laughs> he just talks for hours. His girlfriend is actually very concerned about him. Very, 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 very. All right, well, thanks for listening, everybody, and we will be back in two weeks. See you then. See ya. You're listening to The Main Loop, a bi-monthly discussion about what makes games interesting, fun to play, and shit.